follow along on Twitter. Uh, we are using the hashtag GetTalentToday, and you can see here uh, information to find them online, and so you can also follow them on Twitter as well. And a couple little housekeeping tips like we usually go over. You can ask questions on the control panel. You'll see where you can type them in. Um, Time permitting, I might shout them out along the way, or we might just wait and use them at the very, very end. It just depends on how they trickle in. Uh, but go ahead and type them in, and I'll be able to let um, our presenter know if they, you know, as they come in. So use your control panel right over there. You'll see you can ask some questions. And don't forget, uh, you can also follow along on Twitter hashtag Get Talent. And looky look, today's expert is my buddy Matt Charney. He's the one that's going to be leading the way on everything today to talk all things in sourcing tech talent. Um, so yeah, send us your questions and I'll be sure to bother Matt and make sure that he gets them answered at some point. Um, if we don't get to all the questions, I apologize, but we'll get back to you. I will follow up with everybody and we will have the recording available for you of today's webinar uh, within 24 hours, so no worry. Um, I'm going to hand it over to Matt. We're going to get started. Matt, I'm handing it over to you, pal. All right. Thank you. Um, can, can you see my screen, Lutz? Or, yeah, uh, it's beautiful. Okay, cool, cool. Just wanted to just wanted to make sure. Hold on one second. Make oh. it <laughs> yeah, yeah, no. So this is this is by the way, just just uh, so everyone knows, um, it's the thing about technology is if you're talking about technology, the tech's not gonna work. Um, I was actually doing a briefing with Google and Hangouts stopped working, uh, and then Chrome froze. So that's just kind of how it goes. But I would like to welcome everyone today. We are talking about one of those topics that apparently people just can't get enough of, and that is sourcing tech talent, which, by the way, is a really hard thing to do. Uh, but that said, hopefully today uh, we'll be giving you some tips, tricks, and insights uh, to kind of manage the process, make it a little bit easier. And before we get started again, I'd like to thank Get Talent for making this possible. If you're here for tools and Chrome extensions and Boolean strings and that sort of thing, uh, I can tell you this is not what we're talking about. Uh, you can feel free to contact me after the fact, and I can give you some recommendations there. Namely, don't use Boolean because no actual search uh, terminology really recognizes that anymore. But um, that said, we'll get kind of into it. My four major points that we're going to cover today. And the first of these is, pun, 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 open source. And if you don't know what open source is, it actually is a way to make software code more diverse something we're also looking for in recruiting, right? And essentially what it is, is it is any time that you have a source code that's open uh, for people to change and make more flexible and to iterate and improve, uh, but that's really open to everyone. And I think it's a good metaphor for kind of sourcing because right now we are really restricted when we open up tech searches and search for candidates, right? So, Let's see, uh, got the whitest guy in the world here. Uh, his name is Jim Whitehurst. And uh, I think he's a good quote. It's much like recruiting and sourcing. Open source isn't about saving money. It's about doing more stuff and getting incremental innovation with the finite budget you have, which is to say we're always trying to do more with less. And hopefully uh, this is going to be a framework for how you do that. So obviously, and I don't know if you've heard about this uh, since maybe 2012 or thereabouts, but we apparently have a STEM shortage uh, in the United States. And more acutely, we have a skills gap when it comes to technology. I know that's probably breaking news for you. Um, but that said, if you do the math right now, um, and you look at all college degrees that were granted, uh, only about 2.4% of those were computer science degrees, right? According to the Bureau of Labor Statistics. However, when you look at programs for explicit tech positions, that's developers and engineers primarily, um, that said, about 89% of all of those jobs required at least a bachelor's degree in computer science, right? So where are you beating that minimum basic qualification? Well, that's a really good question because there are only 400,000 uh, computer science students right now in the United States, 1.4 million recruiting jobs, and uh, solving this, we say recruiting sourcing is a cost center, it's actually a $500 billion opportunity to try to to try to get that leveled out. Um, so what you're really starting to see uh, is that they, this is a market, obviously candidates uh, with full employment across the board are getting much harder to hire, but double that through 2020, 
for computer science majors. So how as we recruiters work with that? Well, the first thing I just want to kind of remind everyone is that, in fact, you don't need a college degree in the first place in order to succeed in tech. Now, I don't know if you know who any of these people are. Uh, the guy in the middle is actually, uh, I forget it, but he started some, some company called LinkedIn, I believe. Uh, and the guy on the right is, uh, is an intern at CAA. But uh, no, I, obviously you don't need an education. And that's, I think, one of the primary fallacies that employers make. And this is really something uh, that's fairly obvious you can go over with your hiring managers, right? Is that if you are having trouble filling your pipeline, you are looking primarily for positions where you can go through any number of open source communities. GitHub's probably the most prominent, Stack Overflow certainly one. Uh, Hacker Earth uh, is a big one in Europe, certainly coming over to the United States, where you can actually see the types of programs and projects that people are, have been working on. You can see the proof of concept in the product. As we all know, there's no correlation between GPA and on-the-job performance. And similarly, there is no correlation between success and being a high potential performer in technology and, and even having that education. Um, but in addition to the fact that those candidates are harder to find, also cost more, right? So uh, just kind of take a look at the trends. Um, these are the hardest to fill roles in tech right now. Um, and, and if you look, a lot of those are developers and engineers. And, and what's the difference between those two terms? Uh, it, it's, it's largely semantic. Uh, but that said, if you look, even after 60 days, which is kind of your standard benchmark, you have a very low fill rate for positions and very high salary. That should come as no news if you've actually tried to build a pipeline for tech. So how do you go ahead and solve this? Because if you're in sourcing, you still have an open job after 60 days, and more than likely the hardest to find ones are gonna be out of your salary range, you're gonna to have to actually strategically intervene and reconfigure how you're looking for that pipeline, right? Um, and exacerbating this problem, it's pretty simple. Uh, there's a supply and demand thing. It's kind of the fundamental of Western economics. Um, and, and right now, that market obviously is very much in the hands of tech candidates. Uh, and, and we like to say things like, oh, they really are drawn to culture or, you know, if we have a slide in our office, then uh, we're going to be able to get the best developers in the world. That's, that's actually not the case. Uh, essentially, they are like the rest of us, uh, which is to say tech talent uh, cares about money. Uh, really more than anything else, as well as job security as well, which I, 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 is really important. So I think a lot of companies make the fundamental attribution error that we have to think like a startup and be nimble like a startup. And, and in fact, and we'll go into this a little bit later, if you look at the statistics, about 82% of tech people who were recently surveyed said that they didn't want to work in a startup environment, right? So if you're a company that might not be the sexiest or coolest, which is to say not uh, Google, Facebook, or Apple, right? That doesn't actually mean that you're not gonna be able to compete with them. And, and in fact, while well, well, those are obviously more stable, just because you're not a startup, just because you're more established, that's actually a competitive advantage. But money is the number one thing. Essentially, if you are a .NET developer, you're working on what looks to be a very similar code base from company to company. So what's really the difference? It's gonna be how much money you make to change that code base, right? Uh, kind of exacerbating this too is when we take a look at candidates who, let's say you found the perfect front end developer, right? You get them all the way through process and then you get to the end of the offer. This happens actually much more frequently than any other job function or family. And why? It's compensation. 39% of uh, offers that were rejected or because somebody else has a better offer. And that's the one thing that you really need to know when you kind of look at that days to fill measure is that this is a commoditized market. So if you're not able to make an offer quickly, if you get held up somewhere in process, that candidate's already talking to a bunch of other companies. So you're not gonna get the opportunity to get them. With a finite supply of candidates, that's not really something you can risk. Um, and number two, we're gonna talk about a little bit later, but Career and professional development is something that's really, really underrated in this space. Just because they're brilliant coders or just because they are the best QA person in the world does not necessarily mean that tech candidates don't want to learn and grow. So we'll come back to those, but just something to look at. Uh, another thing too is that you have certain markets that are really, really hyper competitive. And that's really driving a lot of the demands for salary and why a lot of people can't pay market uh, for these candidates. 
is that you have tech that's kind of clustered, obviously, uh, around certain hubs. Uh, the San Francisco Bay Area being the most prominent, uh, New York as well, and then you have uh, you know your your Boston's and Seattle's of the world. Uh, interestingly, Baltimore is up there as well, um, which I think that's because the entire city burned down except for for the three buildings uh, where tech companies are. So if you look at this. Um, and go down the list kind of, if you are open to candidates who are coming out of other markets, that uh, $113,000 average salary is going to look a lot more enticing to somebody who's working out of Minneapolis or Salt Lake than it is for somebody who's living in San Mateo. So almost across the board, uh, if you're reconfiguring your, sur your sourcing strategy, it is cheaper to pay for a full relocation than it is to pay at market salary. So just something to think about. Uh, again, the cost of living in the top cities for jobs is astronomical. Um, obviously the lowest on here is Detroit, which I think is one tech, tech employer, and I'm not sure the top tech talent wants to work at, at Quicken Loans. But, but obviously, you know, you go down this list and you kind of see how this problem beyond just the skills gap is, is expanding, why it's becoming so darn expensive uh, to hire technologists. But, the interesting thing is, despite the fact that we have a, a predisposed bias to look within certain areas, I think in every tech sourcing product demo I've ever seen, it's always, always, for some reason, a Java developer in San Jose. Um, and, and I think that we default on that for, for whatever reason. That's obviously the hub. But if you kind of look out uh, at where the growth is, uh, and this is actually, this is actually, you know, already happened. It's a little bit older slide, but it's happening in areas that are not actually anything that you would ever ascribe to tech. Toledo, Ohio is a great example. So they have a huge pool in Toledo, uh, which, by the way, is is one of the worst cities I've ever been to. And I'm sorry if I have any Toledans here on the call, but um, you know, it's a it's a Rust Belt city. It's got a good art museum, but not a huge tech base. And so that is fundamentally changing. And you also have a big supply of talent that's sitting there and already working at companies, right? Because this is where the jobs are. So really this is talking about if you're building a pipeline, <laughs> expand on your sourcing strategy to look outside of the markets that you'd normally go. It's, it, it's, there's a preponderance of software developers in San Jose, but you're also gonna have pretty decent chances in these other markets. So we talk about this as well. I, I hear a lot when I speak, uh, and I do a lot of work with, with tech companies, that, oh, we're not one of those cool Silicon Valley companies. How are we ever going to compete with them? And in fact, you know, I would say that, that it's jumped the shark with all due respect to the 415 Helen NoCal people on this call. Um, we look at the tech workers, actually 68.3% of them don't consider working in Silicon Valley important. So if you're one of those majority of employers who aren't there, uh, the good news is that, um, you know, this is not something that you have to really worry about from a competitive subset. Uh, additionally, because it's really expensive and people are being priced out, jobs are becoming much more, um, you know, locked in and, and, and the market's kind of oversaturated, you're starting to see an exodus of people out too. So, so kind of follow this trend, right? Uh, how do I pay less, have a better pool of talent, build better pipelines who are more engaged and more qualified? The answer, like anything in sourcing, is if everyone else is zigging, make sure you zag. Um, we get to this, and, and nobody in sourcing is really going to have a big play in this, but if you look at any, any tech company, particularly in those hubs we were talking about, they tend to put an emphasis on physical space and how cool their office is, right? Like that seems to be just a universal uh, sort of default is, wow, look at these, look at these cool spaces we have. We've got ping pong tables and kegerators and stuff like that. And the problem is if everyone has that, then A, you're not differentiated, and B, have you ever talked to a programmer? They want to be in the dark in as isolated of an environment as possible working on code. If they are enjoying your fine perks like a kegerator uh, or a beanbag chair, it's probably because they are taking a short break from their marathon coding session, right? So when we look at kind of presenting opportunities, the other thing just to remember is it doesn't matter 
what your office looks like. And programmers are smart, right? They know that when you offer perks, uh, and I'll use Google as an example, on-site dry cleaning, you know, childcare, transportation, essentially they know when you build up those benefits that work by balance, which as we saw earlier is an important driver for tech talent, uh, is probably crap because you are building uh, incentives for them to never leave the office and they've wised up to that by now, right? So um, we look at this thing called the cloud. Certainly you see a trend to companies having a virtual or dispersed workforce, particularly within tech, right? And so I would advise everyone who's building pipelines to really think, and I don't know how much power you have over this, but certainly if you're hiring managers or in the tech organization or tech leadership, they're gonna have a little bit of power to change this. And most people are actually gonna be fairly open to the idea um, that 90% of tech workers are actually happier in their jobs when they work from home. Um, you know, 92% hate their commute, which the other 8% are, are probably sleeping at the office, right? And, and then when it comes to getting salary, uh, almost three-fourths of people would choose a job of equal salary and title to that of a competitor if you can just shorten their commute. So think about all the wasted time, right? New York, 40 minutes, Chicago, 40 minutes, San Francisco, a half hour a day. That is a huge opportunity cost loss that nobody wins in. So if, again, you can offer the chance to have a flexible work schedule, you're actually going to be at a competitive advantage over companies that are even paying more money, right? So uh, Joel Spolsky um, has a great quote. He says, programmers spend their lives looking at a screen. The good ones don't have time for ping pong or keg readers or any of the stuff the companies think we care about. Work is something we do, not somewhere we go. When it comes to shipping product on time, writing good code, and being able to really attract people who are high performers within tech, don't continually emphasize how cool your offices are because I guarantee this, when it comes to sourcing and pipeline building, your couch beats the culture at any company, okay? So just a few takeaways from section one, programming beats pedigree, doesn't matter what school they go to or what company they worked at, product is everything. Two, expand your geography, and three, home is the coolest HQ, and I think we can all agree on that. Okay, um, number two, coding in basic. So I think that, that people who are sourcing or engaging candidates around tech generally really, really like to use buzzwords. Um, you know, David Ogilvy has this quote, but even when it comes to programming languages, uh, we tend to talk about just those kind of skill sets, like, oh, we're looking for a front-end developer who knows Ruby and Java, and, 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 and you don't know anything about those, or at least at the proficiency that they do. So this section is really about getting away from that and personalizing it around shared experiences because sourcing talent and finding candidates is actually relatively easy. Tech candidates leave a pretty vast digital footprint, but getting those tech candidates when you reach out to them to call you back or, or write you back, much less considered an opportunity, that's the challenge actually. And so let's take a look at some recruiter fails real quick. The, the one on the left is my favorite. I don't know if anyone remembers this, but this is what happens when companies try a little too hard to use industry jargon uh, or, or reach out to, to certain demographics. Uh, hey, Bay intern, uh, I'm Kim, a Microsoft recruiter. Um, lots of drinks, the best beats, and just like last year, we're breaking up the Yammer beer pong tables. That literally sounds like hell to me. Uh, and, and no intern, by the way, probably wants to be referred to as Bay by Microsoft. So uh, you got that. I like these tweets on the, the right that I found. Um, you know, again, recruiter just contacted me about a senior .NET position in San Jose. I'm a senior PHP developer in Chicago, right? Like this happens all the time. Um, and really it's about not even trying to have these conversations because while these are obviously dumb mistakes, uh, you're not gonna be able to out-tech tech uh, unless you, know, you have a background in that, in which case none of this is probably all that pertinent. So, the problem though is that tech recruiters and sourcers actually generally tend to have an overinflated sense of how well they know positions, particularly ones who've been in a while. And I don't know tech recruiters who have been doing it for years, uh, who have sourced for some of the biggest you know, companies, your, your Amazons and Apples of the world. And they, they generally tend to think, oh, because I've worked in this industry for a while, I really know it. Um, and, and they often can't tell you the difference between front end, back end, you know? Um, and fundamental kind of things like that. 
they can say that, oh, I've sourced for PHP developers before, but at the same time, they couldn't tell you what that stands for. And, and that's really reiterated, uh, at the end of the day, we're serving our clients who are hiring managers. And uh, hiring 61% three and five think that uh, recruiters have a low or moderate understanding of, of even the positions they're recruiting for. So hopefully now we've set the scene for why you shouldn't try to speak geek, okay? So it really comes down to not only finding candidates, but building a message. And in order to do that, there's this thing in marketing called personas. And no, the persona of tech candidates is not, uh, you know, uh, the characters in Revenge of the Nerds. Uh, it is somebody who probably looks a lot like me, which is, you know, uh, wearing a hoodie and very work-oriented. So uh, what do they want? Um, busy and full-time job, when they're in flow, uh, which is a huge thing. Uh, programmers in particular just get in the zone, right? So good luck getting them to answer a phone or even open an in-mail, right? Uh, they don't want to be interrupted. They don't care. Um, almost all of them are actually open for opportunities, but they're not necessarily looking, that famous passive candidates. Um, so, you know, just kind of go through there. Uh, but the real question you always have to answer, because if you're finding an awesome tech candidate, there's a 100% chance that, you know, every other employer out there has too. You have to come up with a compelling answer to the question, why in the world should this person want to talk to you? And that is really the fundamental sourcing gap uh, is engagement and not only engagement, but really personalizing and targeting messages to people, right? If you're getting those emails, which we all have, that's like, hello, first name, last name, I have an exciting opportunity for you in blank. Like, nobody is going to respond to that because, uh, you know, I know I'm in demand. You're not even taking enough time to, to personalize this if you're, you're sending out a, a marketing email, right? And there are ways to do automation correctly, but most of the time we just fail at it. So this is really it. When we look at why people leave jobs in tech, I think number one is actually really interesting. Now, again, compensation is why they accept an offer, but why do they leave? It's limited career and promotion opportunities. And I think that's really important because there seems to be a huge tendency when sourcing for tech for working with hiring managers, posting job descriptions and building pipeline to focus on just the job and the necessary skills that a candidate has to have, the programming languages, the, the you know, experience that certain companies or industries, uh, mobile development, that sort of thing. But really, they're not looking at just a job they're looking for the opportunity to learn and advance and grow just like everyone else, right? So if you're so hyper-focused on just trying to put a button in a seat and fill a candidate for a rep rather than build a pipeline for the future, then you're gonna get a turnover that's just astronomical. We'll take a look at some of those statistics. Um, DICE actually did a, a pretty big survey of, of tech uh, professionals and obviously talked about salary being really important but here's the trick that I think is most interesting, and, and obviously this is not the case uh, that we think about a lot in recruiting, which is that the, comp the, the candidates really appreciate more than any other factor being honest and open about a company and culture, right? Programmers, developers, the techies have a very uh, acute threshold of BS, right? And Joel Spolsky, who I quoted a little bit earlier, kind of lays it out like this. Um, one of the aversions that a lot of people in tech have to recruiting is that they were the nerds in high school and recruiters were kind of like the jocks, right? And so when you're kind of pumping them and this is the greatest culture in the world, uh, this is an unparalleled opportunity and, and you can do whatever you want at this company, they would rather hear this is really hard work, it's really challenging hours, we might not be the most exciting company out there, but certainly our teams are the best and you know, you get to work on some really cool projects. They'd much rather hear a qualified message than the hyperbole that we often send. So I think that's really just important to keep in mind. And number two is responding to my messages, which we talk about candidate black holes, which I get if you're hiring an AP clerk, right? Like you're gonna get 200 resumes for that and yeah, half of them probably aren't qualified. But again, when you have such a dearth of qualified candidates, why in the world would you go and automate and, and stage a huge outreach, right? Uh, post, pray, and, and do whatever you can, and then not get back if they get back to you. I, I hate using the term candidate experience, but in this case, it's really, really important. Uh, just make sure that you're able to close the communication loop. You do that by qualifying candidates, not by blasting them, okay? So 
again, the size survey that they did, which I, which I like, one in four tech pros says that the reason they don't respond to recruiter is because the message is too generic, yet 55% actually link to a specific job, again, in their original outreach. So if I have one piece of advice, do not talk about specific job opportunities. Never lead with that. You have to get over their version of talking to recruiters first. And how do you do that? How do you separate yourself from all the other recruiters who are trying to contact them out there? Uh, the answer that's really simple, you don't come across as a recruiter. You come across as a person who is interested in learning more about them. And from there, somebody who's representing a company and a brand. But if we're hiring for careers and if we're playing to people's aspirational natures and character, then just saying, oh, we're looking for, a, we're looking for a PHP developer or we're looking for somebody who knows Ruby on Rails, like, like they're just going to ignore you. So again, never lead with the job, lead with literally the opportunity and you'll be okay, right? Um, and, and there's a lot of easy ways to do this. Certainly automation, a lot of this really comes down to messaging. But if you throw a job description link in there, or you talk specifically, I have a great opening that I think you'd be an awesome fit for. Well, you don't really know anything about me. And maybe my skills align, but that doesn't necessarily mean it's a great fit. You are going to be ignored, okay? So what do they want to know? Essentially, they want recruiters to have a better understanding of how those skills, right, fit into a job opportunity that's being offered, which is to say, uh, again, while you don't lead with a specific job, you're going to have to vet them for skills, right? Because if you're hiring for Python developer, they have no experience in Python, they're really no good for you, but, but those are not all created equal. So understand where that fit happens and play to those commonalities as opposed to, hey, we match keywords. You must be awesome for this job, right? So when you're building targeted outreach, there are a few things that I would definitely recommend. You can personalize this, do it the hard way, you know, cut and paste. Uh, you can do, you know, uh, macros, uh, or obviously you can automate it. And there are a lot of great tools out there to do that. Um, the first is to personalize it, right? So uh, include links to your personal profiles. Don't play gatekeeper here, right? You want them to connect with you on LinkedIn. Uh, more importantly, uh, if you look at programmers, you want them to be able to find you on Twitter. Um, probably not Facebook so much. Uh, if you have an account on GitHub, even better, right? Like fish where the fish are and make sure that people can check you out and that you're a real person, not just a machine that's blasting spam all day, which is what a lot of recruiters are, right? Two, make sure you include your contact info. Uh, obviously people have different styles, just send in mail. People aren't necessarily gonna wanna respond via in mail, but maybe they wanna pick up the phone uh, you know, and call you. Um, most commonly, they probably wanna text you. So just make sure that you are oriented enough to give them the options on how to contact you. If once they check you out, they figure out that you're a fit. Three, writing needs to be 100% air free. I want you to think like a coder for a second. You were sitting there and looking at lines and lines and lines of code all day, and you were making sure that those are perfect or else the product uh, that you're working on is essentially not gonna work. If you have a grammar error, you have a spelling error, or you accidentally, you know, leave a, a field out of, of a macro, so it's first, last name. That is anathemia to anyone who's building a code base, and that shows the values misalignment, right? They are hypersensitive to that. I wouldn't say they're necessarily grammar, grammar nerds, but at the same time, uh, they will notice that, and it's, it's a huge lack of professionalism, um, that, that especially with coders, that, that they will flag immediately. Um, again, Always be visual, right? Uh, you know, if you take a look at, at any sort of uh, study on this, um, programmers tend to be hyper visual uh, learners, uh, you know, which is to say they find out more by looking and experiencing, they do by reading. So a way to kind of play to that proclivity is obviously to include as many images, videos, or any sort of rich media and outreach as possible rather than just words, that's gonna go a long way. Um, and, and, and the last one, again, establish credibility. Why do they wanna to talk to you? It's because everyone goes to the same place, essentially, to find out information, that's Google. So if they just see somebody who's worked for six months at a staffing company and who has no other experience, or somebody who's you know, hopped around to, from company to company recruiting programmers and then their messaging is being led off with, this is the greatest company and opportunity in the world. Like there's no credibility there. So just make sure 
that your messaging, the way you present yourself, aligns with what's going to be found when they look you up, just like you're looking them up. Okay, so basic programming. Research the candidate before you reach out. Fairly simple. Two, make sure there's a match or don't waste your time. At recruiting, you have to make one hire, right? It's, it's not about finding and screening 85 candidates, submitting 20. It's about making one hire. So you have to be selective when it comes to who you need to spend your time on. And the third is don't make empty promises, right? A lot of companies will generally overreach or be uh, you know, a little bit too rosy in the way they present opportunities. But guess what? If they are successfully going through process and get hired, they're going to find out if you're lying. And that just creates another problem to talk about now. Uh, so number three is build, don't buy. Okay? So this guy, I have no idea who he is, uh, kind of looks uh, like uh, you know, uh, a French mime with that black turtleneck. Uh, but it says, doesn't make sense to hire smart people and then tell them what to do. We hire smart people so they can tell us what to do. Which is to say, again, I want to take another recruiting anecdote, which is college football, right? Which I'm a huge fan of. Um, but essentially, there's a thing called an athlete in college recruiting. So you have, you know, everyone has different positions, uh, wide receiver, quarterback, running back. Um, but the most valued recruits are actually what are called athletes, which is you can plug them into any position and they're going to be able to move the ball. And that is something that I think we really lose is that you need to be able to hire for fit and proclivity and, and be able to teach for skills. Look, there's a like coding boot camps are a great example, I think, of this, right? Like if you can promise me that I can learn all these languages and get a job in just six weeks, why can't I do that at your company? You know, these are things that are teachable. And these are things that should not knock somebody out of hiring consideration if they are the right fit and if you were strategically building a pipeline. So just taking a look at why I'm recommending building versus buying is within tech, there's a 2.8 average uh, year average job tenure. Actually, Google, the number one most desired employer uh, in tech, that it's 1.2 years, uh, which is to say, um, you know, as good an employer brand, as attractive as an employer they are, people get that experience on the resume and they're gone. So t people aren't staying around a whole lot. They're moving around. There's a high, high rate of motion. Actually, recruiters are 2.6 years. So if you've ever sat in a recruiting or sourcing department long enough, you know this phenomenon, right? People are in and out and in and out and in and out. Um, beyond that within tech, as hard as we work to get these candidates hired, and as much money as we're paying them, actually, uh, one out of every four tech hires is going to fail within the first year. So that's a pretty high failure rate, really, by, by any estimation, right? So, so how do we cut that down? And, and also, we want to pay our awesome people more because generally in tech, we're trying to build that functionality out, we're trying to build that department, we're trying to build products. However, we get into this money pit situation where we're throwing most of, our, most of that overhead right back into filling roles that we screwed up hiring in the first place. So much like any QA process, we want to cut down on user error. Well, how do we do that? Okay, the first is really simple. Look inside the organization before you look outside the organization. And here's a huge area of opportunity when it comes to sourcing. I talk to recruiters all day who reflexively, when they get a job opening, will post it online, wait for resumes to come in, which we all know very rarely happens, right? And then they will do all these interesting sourcing hacks, you know, uh, which I know is the name of this webinar, but I'll x-ray this site. I will set up a job feed and, and tweet using strategic hashtags. Like, that's all cool and clever and probably makes you feel like you know what you're doing. But at the end of the day, that yield is not great because that's everyone's strategy. Whereas very, very few companies, uh, as you can see here, actually have any sort of um, process in place uh, for internal mo movement and, and, and mobility, which as we saw is not only a reason why people turn down offers if they don't see a career there, um, not only do they have the propensity for moving around, but at the uh, you know, same virtue, um, the reason why people leave companies is there's no movement and no growth. So if you are promising those opportunities, you're going to have to deliver them. And this is the number one area of opportunity is you probably already know your next hire. They probably already work for you and they're probably looking to leave. Okay. 
So we're recruiters and sourcers, right? And, and it's always about, uh, I think the phrase is uh, work smarter, not harder. Um, from my experience, uh, a lot of us tend to not like working at all. So just playing into that proclivity, much like we would with coders, if you take a look, the average externally posted position in the United States right now has around 200 uh, external applicants, right? However, uh, when you look at the split on interviews and, and hires, half of all interviews are coming from internal applicants, okay? So half, which is to say the average of those is three, three versus 200, yet they're getting half the interviews. When it comes to hires, always, 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 internal is the number one source of hire. So why would you not take candidates you know are in price range, geographically, they're a good fit, and they are, you know, ready to make a move. They're, they're going to move. Why not make it within your organization, right? If those people, again, uh, aren't ready to move or you don't have the internal capabilities, because a lot of tech companies are obviously growing, then referrals are everything, right? And we talk about establishing credibility as a recruiter. It's often very hard to do. But that credibility exists within that same internal population you're looking to recruit for, which is really something you need to, to task your hiring managers and your other internal stakeholders of the tech organization with. So you kind of just look at this breakdown. Um, this is, uh, you know, 25% of, of all candidates, and I say candidates, not applicants, who come in and get through a process uh, generally tend to be uh, coming out of employee referrals. But at the end of the day, referrals, the, the people who are being, you know, championed by somebody in your organization 400 times that's not percent that's times more likely to get hired than online applications so why are we spending so much time trying to build those funnels outside the organization look inside first if you can't find it inside ask those people who they know uh, again you have a problem with turnover referrals stay longer generally tends to be happier than any other source right um, Another thing to consider, again, is, is really being able to articulate both internally and externally a solid career path. Uh, this is kind of a breakdown uh, just for some general software engineering positions. Uh, you can see if the number one source is 7% uh, were software developers before engineers, which are essentially the same title, and then afterwards they moved up to senior software engineer. This to me just shows that there is a misalignment between uh, where people are going from a, a perspective and then the ability to be able to define clear career trajectories. So make sure that you take the time to really understand before developing a sourcing strategy, not only what the role is for this person, but what the next one looks like too. Because if they're the same rate of movement, 2.7 years, um, then you really, really want to be able to speak to the next position, not just the one you're hiring for. Because it's going to come sooner than you know. Um, Great way to do this is to obviously, if you're backfilling, you're promoting people like you should be, uh, you really want to be able to hire uh, as low level as possible, right? That, that's, that's a no-brainer. Anyone knows that it's easier to hire a manager than it is a director, and everyone knows it's way, higher to, uh, it's way easier to hire a, uh, just an engineer than it is a CTO. That goes, that goes without saying, right? Uh, a great place, and I think that a lot of people in tech uh, overlook this, particularly outside Silicon Valley, is interns, 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 right? So uh, they're very cost efficient, and it's also probably the best way to get people into your organization with tech talent, get them loyal and get them to stay, right? So 97% of companies who had tech internships programs said that those interns were good or excellent. And then of those interns, 88%, which is a staggeringly high number actually, would recommend uh, that company to their friends. And we talked about referrals earlier, but you know, these are, these are people who if you get them without a lot of job experience, they'll be very loyal and very vocal about what a great place your company is to work, okay? And, and I, I just pulled this uh, you know, base monthly salary for interns to show that while we tend to dismiss them, I actually, you know, was an intern in the entertainment industry, so I made zero dollars to essentially make photocopies and get copy. But, but they have a lot of value in tech. Dropbox is paying $8,500 monthly base salary for an intern. Uh, and, and you just kind of look on down the line. Um, the whole point of the slide is that just because they have no experience doesn't mean that they're, they don't have worth. And you're seeing some of the leading companies in the industry really respond to that and, and, and strategically pay to get interns in because the conversion rate's so good. So 
uh, you know, this goes without saying tuition reimbursement, the opportunity to learn, grow, even if you're offering like online learning uh, or opportunities like that, uh, it's going to really increase uh, the rates of retention. And, uh, you know, I would definitely say that uh, the lower you go uh, in terms of the totem pole, the higher your chances of success are going to be and ultimately move these people through the organization. Um, and uh, just some stats, again, to why if you don't have an internship or dedicated UR program, you really should think about it. Uh, of all of those interns out there, 63% of paid tech internships lead to full-time offers. That's a way higher rate than any other industry. Uh, almost 90% of hiring managers said that the interns they had were better prepared and higher performing in that first job than people who they hired at the same level from outside the organization. Why? It's a good training ground, right? So if your goal is to get high performers who are going to get up to productivity as quickly as possible and be able to contribute, I mean, this is, to me, a no-brainer. And again, we talk about just getting people who are loyal, 82% uh, compared with, uh, I think, just under 50% uh, of the interns who are hired into full-time roles. Those organizations actually end up staying with the company for longer than three years. So really, really, really overlooked. And I think a really valuable thing to think about while sourcing. Highlight here, if you don't have an internship program, probably work on getting one. It is a way, way better source of investment than that LinkedIn recruiter license, I promise. So for build, don't buy. Uh, you already know your next hire. You're not providing jobs. You're providing careers, right? And the third, interns are awesome, right? Fairly simple. Number four, eh, whatever works, or as I like to say, do you boo, okay? I think we have a tendency to focus too much on the tech. So whether that's the code base or what tools we're using to find all these profiles and, and build pipelines and automated marketing and all that good stuff. Uh, if the answer is technology, what is the question? Why is it you're looking to hire this person beyond the tech, right? So um, I like to apply this thing. Uh, it's very controversial. It was a 15th century Franciscan friar named William of Ockham. He had a philosophy called Occam's Razor for tech sourcing. And I think that this is a really good thing to apply when you're thinking about sourcing candidates, is we want to get really clever and really creative. And I know that we have a proclivity, certainly within sourcing, to talk about where are all these cool sites that we're on and all this stuff like, well, let's source off Snapchat. That is entirely inefficient and is probably going to lead to nothing. Social recruiting is another good example. Ten years in, that's 3% of external hires for all the money and time we spent on that stuff, right? So Occam's Razor basically says this. Uh, the simplest analysis is usually the correct one. That is true in sourcing. Your goal is to move from rec to hire. Why do you have to make the front end of that process so overly complicated? Don't get cute. Don't get clever, get a hire, okay? So when you're considering strategy, when you're considering tools, tech, Chrome extensions, any of the manifold uh, things out there that you can do to build pipeline, ask these questions. Will it help me make better hires faster? Okay, pretty simple. Is it in the best interest of the company? Also really simple. Is what I'm doing basically trying to be cool and get a, a, an interesting source of hire or does it align to the P&L and, and long-term business needs? And, and, and third, does data support my decision, right? So am I getting bang for my buck? Is this ROI uh, being created by what I'm doing? Or am I just wasting time and money because I'm sitting in a cost center trying to be all cool and building 28 modifier Boolean strings just because I think I'm cool, right? So uh, again, in God we trust, all others bring data. And generally, if you don't have that, particularly in tech, uh, your CTO is not going to be too happy. But all it is to say, as much as we emphasize all of that stuff, ultimately, even the smartest of technologies uh, require smart people to make them work, right? Machines can't learn without people. Artificial intelligence with really dumb end users is actually just going to end up being stupid. So put your faith and budget in technology, but at the end of the day, High touch beats high tech every single day of the week. And if you can personalize the experience for tech candidates, if you can provide them a concierge level service, and if you can actually just be human, that is literally the silver bullet. Forget what any product in the market says. Okay? 
So with that in mind and natural seed, I'd like to turn it over to our sponsor, Get Talent. Thanks so much, Matt. Um, you know, I, I think that for us at Get Talent, you know, you made a lot of really great points during your webinar, and, and there's a lot of things that really kind of resonate with us. You know, hearing you talk about the importance of maybe considering um, candidates from different geographies when you're pipelining and, and kind of leveraging automation to make it easier to, um, you know, do targeted outreach to candidates because nobody wants to have anything that really feels like it's cookie cutter or, or you know, kind of sent to the masses. Um, and, you know, these are things that, we, we definitely kind of agree with. I mean, I think for us at Get Talent, it, it's really important to focus on the human aspect of, of recruiting and sourcing. Um, and, you know, a lot of what we do really is kind of just allowing uh, recruiters and sourcers to connect better with candidates so that you can have these meaningful conversations and, and connections. Um, you know, for those of you that don't know what Get Talent does, um, we are uh, a CRM system uh, mixed with marketing automation, and it is uh, tailor-made just for recruiting. Um, so what we do is we actually enable sourcing and recruiting teams to, um, you know, make uh, candidate leads and build engaged talent pools so that you can have those conversations with people, um, you know, about uh, roles that are relevant to them at the right time. Um, you know, it makes it easier for you as a recruiter and sourcer to find and hire qualified candidates um, and make it fast and easy. Um, you know, we do a whole bunch of different things and we'll, um, you know, send out some information after this webinar um, if anyone's interested in a demo. Um, and we'll also be giving out uh, Amazon gift cards to the first, I think it is 25 people that sign up. Awesome. Thank you. Um, yes. Uh, so I guess now we're turning over to questions. I'll start with the question pane. Guess the first to comment, uh, Mr. Larry Warren says Matt Charney kicks ass, and you, sir, have impeccable taste, so good on you. Um, second question, can I get these slides? And yes, yes, you can. Uh, they will be sent to everyone uh, along with a full recording within 24 hours, uh, again, through the powers of marketing automation. Um, again, you've been using sourcing and recruiting interchangeably, asks Rob Beck, are they? My answer to this is yes, and I'll tell you why is generally we look at sourcing as main generation, right? Like, let me just fill as many qualified people into a pipeline or database as possible. But in order to make them actually just a candidate, right, there's three preconditions. Qualified, which you get from sourcing, interested and available are the other two. Because without those three preconditions, you're not making a hire. So in as much as sourcers have to engage candidates in order to qualify them, right, then I think that largely they're the same discipline because certainly there are a myriad amount of tools out there, uh, free and paid, where you can find anyone who's got a GitHub repository uh, or experience or named on LinkedIn for like, you know, Java developer or, or Ruby on Rails experience, right? But again, contacting them, getting them interested and engaging them into the process, that we generally consign to recruiting. And I think that's where the real skill lies um, so I'd say the only real difference generally is sourcing tends to focus more on candidates, and I think that uh, you know recruiting, as much as they're they're often separate functions, tends to focus largely on process and, and hiring managers. Um, but I think sourcing is is, is everybody's interested, and again, if you're not reaching out and qualifying a candidate, you're not able to understand what the needs of the company are, then you're going to be outsourced. So congratulations. Um, let's see, any other questions? Uh, is that, Marce uh, Steve Jewell asks, is that Marcel Masseau? Uh, no, but I bet you wish you had a mime leading this webinar. And uh, then get another question. I'm working on so many recs at once. How do I manage 35 to 45 recs and also personalizing experience? Uh, that's a good question. I think that, again, a lot of recruiters are gonna answer that by, I'm going to cut and paste a LinkedIn in mail a hundred times. I'm going to post a job everywhere I can and I'm going to tweet as often as I possibly can using uh, hashtags like Java Detroit developer. Like, uh, forget that, right? If you have a compelling, clear message that's gonna resonate with high-performing tech talent, that becomes imminently scalable. Again, we talk like, you know, about personalizing a message. I don't mean like, hey, I saw that you went to Cal. How about that Bears game on Saturday? Can't believe they barely lost to Stanford. That's not what I'm talking about. What I'm talking about is understanding the wants, needs, desires, and motivations of programmers, 
And much like recruiters, which I would say are not working a whole lot, making money, and easy access to alcohol. I kid, I kid. Um, there's a lot of commonalities there. We discussed some of them, but ultimately, if you need to understand that persona we talked about, like why should somebody call you back? Why should they consider a job? Talk to your hiring managers, talk to your internal stakeholders, and see what's important to them, because not only are you gonna be able to get a sense of how to tailor a message for the type of person that they're gonna ultimately wanna hire, you're also gonna get good, good culture fit, and as much as that is important uh, for the reasons of turnover and also internal mobility, um, I really advise doing that and then start blasting, but make sure that you have a clear value prop that's differentiated and also have a really easy way with as many options as possible for, for candidates to contact you back. At the, at the end of the day, really, the major difference between a lot of tech recs ends up lying in, in the language and, and the career level. And those are easy, easy things to correct for, even in the, the lightest of automation solutions. Okay, name some sources, this is from Sandra, thank you Sandra, uh, that you recommend for tech recruiters to get up to speed on technology so they can sound more intelligent when speaking with candidates. I would advise again to de-emphasize pretending to know tech or use buzzwords, right? I, I think that the much easier thing than trying to, for instance, uh, know every front end development language and know like the difference between C sharp and C plus or know the difference between somebody who's doing, um, you know, network security, network administration. Those are probably terrible examples. Um, those, those are kind of, uh, you know, semantics largely in, in other than learning how to code, which I'd highly recommend everyone do because guess what? It's a recession proof job at this point in time. Um, I think it's actually just more important to stay on top of industry trends, right? So being able to talk intelligently about what's going on in the market and kind of the more macro picture than just the specific codes. Because you'll sound really cool and cutting edge if you know like who got funded, what companies are releasing products, and, and certainly on the side of work, like who's doing layoffs, who's a desirable employer. That helps build targets and also helps build talking points. For that, personally, I'm a huge fan of, of Crunchbase, which will basically, uh, it's a repository daily for funding announcements. So you can kind of know where the money's going, what industries are hot, and stay on top of it that way because you know, largely the code bases don't matter. Um, and, and TechCrunch, uh, which is another obviously uh, tech-focused publication, but that's more newsy. And uh, you know, if you really, really want to sound cool, there's a site called Product Hunt, which you probably saw a, a pop-up show up. And that's just people's like kind of skunk works projects, honestly, that are open source for the most part. Just go in there and start looking at, at, at all the tech tools that are out there. That'll give you a sense of almost what's considered cool among people who, who generally aren't considered cool, right? So, so I would say that don't try to speak geek, try to be human. But more than that, know what's going on in the business rather than the business of tech, if that makes any sense. I really like parallel syntax. Okay, where are you on recruiting versus talent acquisition? Some say they're different. Uh, it's a question from Rob Beck. Um, here's the thing. I think if recruiters do their job right, then there should be no such thing as talent acquisition other than perhaps at entry level or, you know, interns. So uh, again, if the goal as we discussed is internal mobility, right, which is you want to move people up in an organization so you're only hiring the very bottom rungs, that's an optimal organization, then you're not really acquiring talent. You're strategic about internal mobility transfers and then to some degree referrals, but that is very different than acquiring. I see acquiring as commoditization and I think that if you are good at recruiting, then you should not be reliant on external sources of hire, period. Um, I know that's probably semantic. I'm anti-semantic, haha. Uh -huh. But um, I, I do think that, that that's really the difference is that TA is, is internally focused and it's strategic. I think recruiting generally tends to be transactional and process oriented. And then uh, let's see, I have one more question. What Chrome extensions do you recommend? Um, I don't think that there are any that I would recommend other than to say, make sure you pay attention to permissions because they all essentially do kind of the same thing. But you know, that screen pops up when you add a Chrome extension that says, you're giving them the right to do this, 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 and this. If you don't want some company you haven't heard of to not know your browsing activity, 
right? Or you don't want them to be able to send emails on your behalf. That's the one that freaks me out, by the way. Like, make sure you pay attention to that. And also, I would say, don't be over-reliant on an extension because as we're quickly learning from our good friends over at LinkedIn, those can be turned off at any time. So they, they do make things easier, but if they're not in your database, they're not searchable on a proprietary server, then eh, you're seeing the same information as every other recruiter out there. Um, let's see. May I recommend? Oh, and Amanda says, this is not a question, but if I may, I recommend joining a group where tech people are uh, learning to code. It helps get you to know tech people as people. And that, and Amanda, is a great point, by the way, because the one place I think that's easiest to actually get to build these relationships, build external hiring network, is for whatever reason, and, and recruiters don't want to go to networking events, obviously. Like, I hear that and, and I'm like, oh gosh, you know, because you, you think all these people are going to be hanging up for jobs. Particularly within the markets like New York and Seattle and San Jose, where you have a huge concentration of people, uh, they actually do go to networking events. So I would say, honestly, in person is a really, really good sourcing strategy. And, and the easiest way to do that is and I've done this before, go to meetup.com, just type in tech in your area and see what pops up. Mashable also has a really good listing of events within the technology industry. So on the homepage there at the top bar, it says events. Just kind of go to some of those, press the flash, get to know people, but don't talk to them about jobs. Talk to them about like, you know, what they're all about, what they want. And ultimately, you know, even if it's not a fit, you're never going to end up hiring them. Uh, you're going to build the type of relationship that's going to be able to generate referrals and pay off over the long term. And all of that is to say we are running out of time. Well, no, we didn't get all the questions, but I appreciate all of them. And, uh, you know, follow up with me. It's Matt at RecruitingDaily.com or, you know, uh, you can tweet me at Matt Charney, probably the quicker method, and I will be sure to answer them. And uh, bideep, bideep, bideep. that's all, folks, but we will be getting a recording of this. Um, within 24 hours, or you can just go to recruitingwebinars.com. We'll have that up in about an hour, and you can relive the magic. So with that, again, I'd like to thank our friends over at Get Talent for making this possible. I'd like to thank you guys for tuning in, and good luck sourcing out there, because gosh knows you're all going to need it. Thank you very much.